welcome everyone to our Open Source Friday Australia edition. How are we all going today? Welcome, it's Friday for those in Australia, New Zealand. It's probably Thursday night for anyone tuning in from America. So fantastic to have you all here with us. We've got a great treat for you all here today. Hey Pink Cam, how are you going? Great to see you here again. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, we've got a really good treat for you today. Um, every Friday we're talking to really cool maintainers, people who are doing some really awesome open source projects and we're very excited today to have Project Contour with us. So I'm excited. Who's excited? Everyone's excited, right? Alright, so let's get into it. Let's introduce our special guest for today. So we have Nick Young from Project Contour. Nick, how are you doing today? Yeah, not too bad. Awesome. Awesome. Now here, Nick, you're in Sydney, is that right? Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so so you kind of missed out on the, the crazy lockdown restrictions and stuff. Yes, I did. Had. Oh, lucky, lucky, lucky. <laughs> yeah, counting my <laughs> blessings. Counting yeah. my blessings, that's for sure. Oh, definitely. I know there's a few of us who are a bit, mm, oh, what's going on here in Melbourne? But we're okay. Yeah. We're, going, we're going fine. Um, actually, a question that we've kind of started off on is, you know, with the lockdowns happening and things, have you noticed in yourself um, that you're that you're working more, or that your project is working more? We'll get into the project, but just, just start us off. Have you been working more since lockdown? I, I actually haven't because I was actually working. I've been working remotely for about a year, even before this whole thing started. Um, ever since I came to work on Project Contour, uh, I've been working remotely, um, and so yeah. And then that a i had a really great uh, home office set up set up although this is not currently my real home office this is my temporary one it's a fake um, one <laughs> yeah yeah it's a fake one yeah, yeah but uh yeah i had a chance to really settle in and get myself a really good home office um that i had to destroy to move house but um but yeah and uh, it meant that i was all ready to go and had some pretty good rules for myself around working from home nice uh, nice well speaking of project contour would you like to um, introduce Project Contour and maybe a little bit about some of your experiences and background as well. Sure, sure. So Project Contour is an ingress controller for Kubernetes. Um, we uh, That means that when you're running your Kubernetes clusters, we focus on bringing traffic into your cluster to get to your services. Um, what, and there's a lot of different ingress controllers. Um, you know, the, the one that most people think of is uh, Nginx have an ingress controller. That's kind of the default one. Uh, and uh, Project Contour was built um, to make some things about the ingress experience a little easier particularly when you're running services in prod and you know you want to have a cluster that's shared by a bunch of people and you don't want it stopping all over each other um so we'll come back to that in a minute though yeah for, for me um i um although uh, my although my name is young uh, i'm actually older than i look uh, and i've been doing this tech video for 20 years or so now um so i've been a sysadmin i i, I think i qualify as a crusty sysadmin these days um but uh, yeah, I've been doing various sysadmin things for a long time. Uh, and uh, before working in Contour, uh, I was actually working for Atlassian's Kubernetes team. Oh, nice. um, yeah, 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 it was pretty cool. Um, and uh, we've had a real great opportunity to build some cool tech there. Um, and before I came to work on some other cool tech here. <laughs> yeah, um, Atlassian, they're, they're cool people, great people. Yeah. Another mm -hmm. awesome Aussie startup that's just done amazingly well. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we got to use some really cool Kubernetes stuff very early on in the lifetime of Kubernetes. So um, yeah, I count myself super lucky to have been there for that time. Yeah, that's awesome. So for anyone in the chat, I've linked um, the GitHub um, Project Contour link as well. Um, we'll get into a little bit more about that too. But um, how did you get involved in open source to start off with, Nick, before we jump more into opening up Project Contour? So, um, you know, I've been, I mean, I've been using open source for a long time. I remember, I think the first time that I built um, a proper Linux box was in the late nineties. Um, I built, uh, I was working for like, a, I was doing like IT consulting at the time. And I was like the IT guy for a, couple, a few small businesses. I came into this small business and they had a, um, they had a Windows NT box running a 9600 board modem that would dial up to the internet whenever someone asked for some internet stuff and that was what was actually serving their website oh. so if there was no one in the office for long enough then their website would actually go down um, oh wow wow yeah, yeah. so i built in this custom linux box sorted them out with an isdn line had a whole bunch of stuff running all this sort of stuff so that their website wouldn't go down and their internet connection and all this sort of stuff so yeah, yeah, yeah i've been doing yeah. Uh, oh. definitely hashtag linux strong is what someone's put in the chat <laughs> 
<laughs> it's great. Like, um, totally, yeah. I, I look a lot, um, a lot younger than what I actually am. Um, so I'm the opposite to you, but I, yeah, definitely the days of dial up and just crazy. I remember, um, like I do a lot of Twitch streaming as well. So on one of my Twitch streams, we were chatting about dial up, and I was like, let's go listen to the dial up sound just for some <laughs> good old days. And I, we pulled it up from YouTube, and I think it's got like. 16 million views or something <laughs> crazy on the dial up sound. I was like, yeah, yeah. good sign or a bad What's really <laughs> terrifying? What's really terrifying is when you can tell what speed the modem is connecting at by the dial up sound. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the days. I'm so glad we don't have to deal with dial up anymore. Oh, man. Could you imagine that in the pandemic right now? Ooh. Trying to work from home with dial I mean, we're having enough issues as it is without worrying about dial up. <laughs> yeah, when, uh, when we moved into this. Uh, our sort of temporary place while we're renovating. Um, my kids have been at me like, Dad, 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 why is there no Wi-Fi in our bedrooms? I'm like, Dude, so I just got to set up the extra access point. Give me a little bit, you know. Like, they're like, Where's our Wi-Fi? Yeah, it was back in the day. It's like, sorry, you can't be on the internet and the phone at the same time. Like, yeah, totally. Yeah. Try telling the kids that. Like, <laughs> they just. I've tried to talk to them about that before, and they just give me this look like, what? But the thing is, it wasn't that long ago. Oh, I people know. don't like, realise. But then there's this whole generation of people who just grew up completely without internet. And it's like yeah. Well, now pause for a moment while I make the uh, old man yells a cloud. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, it's great. <laughs> well, let's get into a little bit more about Project Contour. So, um, you mentioned a little bit about what it is, but how did it actually start? The project. So actually. It actually was started by um, by Joe Beta and uh, Cheney um, when they, when they were both at Heptio, um, and so Heptio was a big uh, Kubernetes uh, provider, um, and um, the uh, and so some of their customers were finding that uh, using the Kubernetes ingress model it didn't work um, for production uses sometimes because there's there's a few ways with Kubernetes ingress where you can stomp all over each other accidentally. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, when you're running a real thing in production, you really don't want anybody to accidentally be able to take your words down. That's bad. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, so that's where it came from, is that, uh, you know, to sort of build our own ingress controller that would uh, sort of address some of the, the, the bigger scale issues that you have with running Kubernetes ingress when it's not just, you know, when you're not running something that you're just sort of kicking the tires on. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, from there, um, you know, it, the thing that we've, that, Dave started and that we that I've tried to keep is that it's designed to be a pretty tightly focused tool. It's, you know, it's designed to just do ingress. You know, we don't. You know, wanna, if you uh, when we when we check click, click around the website later in our sort of philosophy document that I wrote a little while ago, the first thing in there is Contour is not a service mesh. So, mm -hmm. you know, because we use we actually implement this using Envoy, which lots of people use for service meshes, and so a lot of the time. I'm sort of saying, yeah, Contour implements an ingress controller using Envoy, and people are like, so it's a service mesh. It's like, no. No, no it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why it's number one on the list. Yeah. Uh, but, but so um, the sort of the basic idea is to take a lot of the goodness that Envoy gives you as a proxy mm -hmm. and enable you to use that to get your traffic into your Kubernetes clusters and get them to you, the services that, you know, the application developers actually care about, right? like, which is the, the actual service that you're running when you say, please run my, my app inside Kubernetes. Yeah, well, speaking around the website, let's go. Let's go click around. So if we look here, this is your um, your project page on GitHub. Um, yep. So again, I like to look at cool, nice places, and people often say, you know, what's a good example of a README? This is a great example of a README <laughs> um, for an open source project. So um, I'll move this this open source right out of the way so everyone can see. Um, but one of the things I'll say is, you know, um, good overview of the project. Um, how to get started because as an open source project and we'll talk about this and I'm going to ask you some tips and advice for the audience um, how to get started how to contribute uh, especially if you're like just landing here for the first time um, a little bit about what it is and then um, like a bunch of links and stuff but this is almost like your landing page um, for a website so um, I like it very much <laughs> nice. so um, all right so where would you like to, to start how about we talk about um, all right, so say if I'm a, um, a maintainer or I'm looking to get into to open source, so I'm not maintainer contributor, I'm looking to get into mm -hmm. open source. If I landed here, what would you be wanting me to do and what would be your tips and tricks for me as a so, first time contributor? Yeah, so, so if you want to, if, if you're like, hey, this contour thing sounds pretty cool, I'd be like, 
a bit chuffed to be honest. But aside from that, yeah, um, the uh, the thing that I that I really like is you know, if you have a read of the document and then down the bottom we've got the you know, the contributing section. You know, and yep. so you know, step one, read our code of conduct, make sure you. Uh, very good. Part. Got a code of conduct. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, this is yeah, you know, this is based on the CNCF one. It's pretty you know standard code of conduct. Basically, it's summed up in Wheaton's rule. You know, don't be a dick. Yeah. Um, Pretty and, much. Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, and uh, but yeah, then then after that we have a, we have a couple of guides about contributing. Yep, contributing.md is the GitHub standard way of doing it. And so, you yeah, know, that's what we use. Um, yeah, we use DCO sign off, which just requires you sign your commits. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but then you know, we've got the you know, here's how you get this, here's how you fetch the source, here's how you build, all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, and then um, once it comes time to actually look for something to do, once you've got the thing building and you've tried it out. Um, yeah, um, well, actually, yeah, one thing that is important that uh, that's in here is uh, I tried to have, uh, I've sort of updated this a couple of times since I started, because mm -hmm. I really wanted to have a good uh, sort of example of what, what we were looking for, like for commit messages. Oh, ah, yeah, you got a commit uh, message template. Yeah, yeah, so like, you know, here, here's what we're kind of looking for when it comes to that, so that we can, you know, so, so we don't have to do a couple of tries backwards and forwards. More projects need to do this. <laughs> <laughs> have a commit template. But this is what we talk about with a lot of our developers when we talk about like good coding practices and like building good culture around your um, your code and yeah. your project. This is it. It's great. So yeah, one of the, one of the things that I really wanted to put in there was uh, if you see, if you see in the t in the template, it's got like imperative mood short description. <laughs> That's so uh, you know it's a bit of a wanky way to put it but it's you know like the the reason is that when you look at the commit log if you have everything in the imperative mood which is like you know as in the second bit add yep. hooks functions rather than i did this or something like that then when you read the commit log it's clear this mm -hmm. commit does this and so that's why that's why it seems odd to be picky about the way the sentence is written but what it means is that later on when someone's looking at the git log it makes it much easier to read. Yeah, you go into a whole lot, you go and see what happens. Yeah, I went to a really good talk actually. It was the last IRL conference I went to, <laughs> um, RubyConf, and one of the um, girls there talked about documentation and how basically documentation can literally, like your code can live or die by documentation. Um, and she has some really funny examples about like how it can all go wrong. Um, yeah. <laughs> and this is just, this is great. Like, and this is what we talk about. Like, you know, this is the reason why we have the commit function and what you don't just commit a, commit a piece of code or commit, um, a new change. You actually can comment on it to make it meaningful. Um, yeah. so yeah, this is, this is really cool. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, and that's why we've got, you know, a little bit about, you know, how we, how the, how we, the maintainers like merge your PRs, we, you, we do squash and merge rather than creating merge commits or anything like that. So that mm -hmm. again, so that the commit history reads better. Yep. Um, and you know, that sort of stuff. And then, you know, it explains about how, how the CI works and how you can run a quit, the equivalent of the CI locally, a few other things like that. I'm actually, yeah, I mean, thanks for the praise. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually been pretty proud of the contributing documentation. I this like is, yeah, really, this is quite yeah. thorough, I would say as well. So like, for example, if I'm coming here to, for the first time to commit or to contribute, I'd be like, I know exactly what is expected of me or what I should do. Um, not only does it make it easier for your project and you know the maintainers to actually understand what's happening and what people are doing, as someone who is coming for the first time, I know exactly what to do. I don't have to yeah. be like, go back and have a look at what other people have done. I don't have to like, think about things too much. And it's much, it's really easy to learn, um, I think is like really key here. Um, but yeah, so you've done some really cool documentation here. What other yeah. tips would you have for um, people who are maintaining projects apart from I guess, cool stuff like this? Yeah, I guess the, the biggest tip I can, give, I can give is to just, you know, every now and again, you need to stop what you're doing, go out and try and come back in being like, I know nothing about this thing. How would I get started? And sort of think to yourself, like, what have I missed in what I do every day about, you know, what should be in the documentation? And actually, the best time to do that is when you get someone new come in to be a maintainer, because a lot of the time they'll, you know, especially I mean, up until we got donated to the CNCF, uh, Contour was very much sponsored by VMware. And so, you know, we sometimes would have new people come on for VMware and that was the time when we could be like, hey, check out all the documentation. If you, you know, if there's anything we've missed, tell us and now's the time to fix it because you're a new person 
who is very strongly invested in being able to contribute here, can you please tell us all the bits that we missed? And that's one of the ways that we've got this good is that by yeah. taking the time when people start to actually get people to, to help, you know, to get the help. Yeah, definitely. I think it's really good. So if we have a look at, um, you know, something we've been talking all about um, at GitHub and something we've been starting promoting is good first issues. Um, yep. So would you like to talk us through some of the good first issues for you and maybe show us some yeah. examples? Yeah, well, we have, a, we have a good first issue label. So if you uh, head to the issues and go to the labels and uh, we've got a few there. Yep. Um, oh, sorry, in, uh, importantly, you know, one of the, one of the things I thought was uh, neat is that um, we opened, we pinned an issue a while ago that's uh, how do you use Contour. Oh yeah, that's uh, cool. Is that a, yeah. Oh, here we go, up the top. Yeah. Right there. Sweet. Yeah. Oh, so what is this one? you asking for yeah, so people to give you ideas on how they use Contour? Yeah, yeah. So that, so we can come and com contact people if we if we're doing something that affects someone who uses Contour in a specific way, then we've got a GitHub idea of someone who we can be like, you know, hey, you know, hey man, like you know, hey person, you know, how, how did you, are you still using it this way? If we're going to change this, can you check it out for me? Like, you know, if, if I'm going to make a change to this, how would you feel about it? That we can mention people on issues and stuff like that and, and have, you know, and have people who are concerned about a particular feature give us feedback on how we build that. Mm. This would be really good as a discussion thread. Okay, noted. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you might not have it set up for your um, project, but if you would like to start using discussions, let us know and we can all sort something <laughs> out there. Um, sure. But you, have you heard about GitHub discussions yet? Um, I, I have seen I've seen them on a couple of projects, yeah. 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 So what you can do as well, one of the coolest things we set up for them, is you can convert an issue to a discussion. So oh, when neat. you can start use discussions, you can say, oh, this would be great as a discussion. Let's click convert. Um, cool. And the coolest thing about discussions over issues is, um, especially for things like this where it's not really a, like a bug fix or something specific, um, you can have all the nested replies, um, which makes oh. stuff like this can be a lot nicer. So that'd be cool. Yeah. All right, It'd so if we go back to, um, yeah, so let us know if you want to get on that. Um, mm. So we're going to um, label good first issue. It's good dash first dash issue. Oh, yes, it is too, sorry. Yep. And I think it's issue singular. Good first issue. And does it doesn't want to come up. Let's go the old fashioned way of labeling it like this. Filter by yep. labels. Here we go. Sometimes it's easier to do that. Sometimes it's easier to do yep. that. Wow, we got lots of them. Yep, <laughs> lots. Lots um, of good first so yeah, issues. Most, yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, we also use the help wanted one for Sometimes things are help wanted, but not good first issue, <laughs> because okay. uh, you know that's when that's when it's like, hey, we know this is important. It kind of requires someone to have a little bit of familiarity with the project before you might try and do it. But at the same time, maybe we might not be able, to, maybe the core maintainers might not be able to get to it for a while. So mm -hmm. that's what help wanted is for. Okay. Um, so we've got a whole bunch of documentation um, things in here. To be honest, that's probably the best place if you really want to sort of get started. You know, that's the yep. best place to get started usually on any project is find some documentation bugs and fix them. Um, yep. Because if nothing else, that will get you, that will get your sort of PR loop sorted out. Um, obviously we are a Kubernetes controller and uh, it's the same flow that in the Kubernetes um, ContribX people recommend is that, you know, if you want to get started with Kubernetes, one of the best things to do is to go find the document, the documentation and find a bug and fix the, fix the documentation bug. And you've fixed. also got yours tagged by documentation as well. I can see that, yes. which is quite easy. But say again, I'm here new and I'm going, oh, okay, well, these are good first issues. So for um, lots of people, the concept of good first issues is, and I'm sure you're using it the same ways, it's a good place if you're a first-time contributor, correct? Yep, to exactly. Go, yeah. To go to that issue as a good first issue, a good place to start for a project. Um, yeah. And you've done even one step further by like tagging them for specific um, areas. So if I'm not quite sure where to start, I can go, oh, yeah, I've got... I've got some skills in documentation. I know how to use certificates, so let's have a look at this. And, yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, we can go here and then go, oh, sweet. So the, you need some help here. Um, yes, exactly. And so oh, this, this is a good example where we've got, um, uh, you know, we've got currently a document that tells you how you can use uh, the, the Project Cert, Cert Manager um, to generate certificates for your installs, um, for your mm -hmm. services. Um, that that currently uses a, a, a dummy ingress object to to kick off the the cert manager flow, 
what this what this issue is saying is, hey, they, they have their own object type that you can create that will also kick off the flow, and it means that you're not creating dummy objects for no reason. You mm -hmm. you're actually creating the object you're supposed to create, and so um, that's what then when Steve logged this issue, that's what he was saying, and so you know you can see here Steve sort of said, hey, we should do that, and then if you scroll down a little bit, <clears throat> you know, one of my jobs as tech lead is to come in and be like, hey, you know, let's add <laughs> I one. agree, this oh, current uh, situation isn't great. <laughs> <laughs> and you wrote that yeah. before COVID. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, one, one of the key, one of the key things uh, that I found uh, the key skills for being a tech lead is uh, understatement. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, and to to what I wanted to do say with that comment is to give people like, what I try and do with these good first issues is to make sure that there's a bit of background in them so people understand why why it is an issue, what we've done about it in the past, and why you want to do something why you want to do something about it mm -hmm. and then if so like a kind of a checklist for things that you should look at um so that so that you're not just sort of being like it's not like a one line please do this and then you've got to come to slack or something like that and find out from us what you need to do in my mind a good first issue issue should have enough information in there that you should be able to work on it without needing to come to us for any extra information yep so yep. when you open up your good first issues or your your good issues your good, amazing issues. Um, so, Steve, is he part of? Is he a? Yes, um, Steve. Yep. So, yes. is he a maintainer of the project as well with you? He is. Yes. Yep. yep. Awesome. So he would open this, and then you would come in. I can say that basically the same date. So you would come in and write your yep. little piece. Yep. Um, then Steve would write back. <laughs> yeah, we sort of we've sort of backwards and forwarded a bit here. Um, so this was when Dave was still working with us. You know, yep. so we've so we've all sort of talked a little bit. Yeah, yep. we definitely need to do something like this. And so on and so forth. We've agreed. Yeah, this is actually what we need to do. Got closed by mistake. Um, you know, yeah. the usual sort of issue flow. Yeah. And then at some point, you know, um, at some point we've you know, added the good first issue label as well. I guess. Yeah. Cool. And so it's kind of sitting there waiting for a would be contributor to come along and contribute to it. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And so that's why we let them in. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So there's um there's a bunch of there there are some code. Uh, related issues as well. Um, you know, most of them tend to be ones where it's a very small code patch that, that would need to be submitted. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's like not you know, it's actually one of those ones where it's a small code patch. The feature, the functionality is not critical enough that we absolutely need to get it in right away. So we're actually specifically leaving that there so that someone who wants to do some coding but doesn't know the project very well has something to come in and do. Yeah. Um, you know, a great example of that if you actually enter the pull requests. There is a pull request for enabling strict YAML parsing in the config file. Ooh. This one? Uh, parse YAML, yep, that's it. So yeah, this was this is a <laughs> there is a yep. There is uh, a uh, yep, there is a there is an issue there, 2623. Um, you know, and that was like, you know, where we discussed. Um, you can see that if you click into 2623, it's a good first issue as well. Ooh, nice. Um, I like this flow. Yeah. This is great. Yep, okay. Good and so, yeah, issue, but, deployment, help wanted. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, this was one where you know, James Peach is also one of the maintainers. And he sort of said, hey, when I was I was doing something with an, adding a new feature mm -hmm. and I found that, you know, the config didn't work and I couldn't figure out why. Uh, yep. And so if we added in strict YAML parsing, then it, we could add in a thing that would make it more clear as to why this particular value didn't work, because, which is because the YAML didn't parse. Yep. Nice. And so, so, yeah, so Tim has come in and said, hey, can I pick this up? And so no problem. He's generated a PR, um, and I think we've had around a review already um, yep. on the PR. Linked an issue and, three days ago. Yep. yep. And again, this is where this is where the commit uh, the commit template comes in because because we strongly recommend to people that, um, well, actually one of the things that's part of our sort of project philosophy is that we talk first and then code. So yep. we, I like we that. Like, I like that. <laughs> Yeah, we don't like to have an we don't like to have a PR without an issue. Yeah. Um, you know, so so that we've agreed that that what we're doing in the PR is actually what we want to do. Sometimes it's easy when you look at a project to be like, I, I need to solve just my problem. Yeah. Um, you know, it's easy to make a PR that solves your problem. But as a maintainer, sometimes what I find is that you know, that might actually create problems for other people because because you as the person who's fixing your problem, which is awesome, don't have the context around how to fix it. What, what problem, yeah, what yeah. other people Problems right? I think it's like the tradey um, equivalent of uh, measure twice, cut once. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. yeah. Talk first, then code is exactly that. That's yeah. Great. Exactly. Remember that. Yeah. That this is, is great. Yeah. yeah. So speaking of like um, 
obviously if you want to come to a project and want to contribute for the first time, um, one of the things you probably really want to know is um, what languages you code in. Yes, um, So what is um, Contour written in? Um, it's mostly Go. Yep. Um, mostly Golang. Um, there's, you know, I mean, if you look at the that nifty thing you've got where it tells you the percentage of thing there, oh, yeah. I think it's, I think it's uh, pretty much almost all Go with a little bit of Makefile and shell script down the side. Yeah. And, and yeah, because we store the source of the site Six, in there, that's why yeah, we Yeah, so 67.8% is written in Go. So if yeah. you're a Go programmer, it's a good place yeah. to start. <laughs> it is, totally, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, basically the entire thing is written in Go. We also have the websites stored in the same repo. So that's why we've also got the, the front end stuff yep. uh, there. Uh, and yeah, and then we've got a, a sprinkling of Makefile and shell scripts and stuff to actually do the building. Nice. So this is another good spot for um, contributors to look at as well. Uh, to go like so for example if you're a ruby programmer this is not going to be useful yeah, um, yeah but if you're obviously go you can say oh, yeah, i am nearly like this whole thing is pretty much written in go this is a really good place to start so absolutely yeah, yeah. yeah. awesome um do we have more questions um from the chat um oh we've got one from pink cam who's i know he's just started learning a bunch of coding as well another one from from my chat um and saying what is um, what is the Go language? Would you like to tell us a little bit more about the Go language? Um, so Go is a uh, is a compiled language um, as opposed to Python or something like that, which is a um, interpreted language. What that means is that in order to run a Go program, you compile the program into a binary that you then run. Whereas with Python, you will take your code and run it directly by the interpreter. Um, the advantage of a compiled language that is good in some situations is that um, you can take that binary, especially in Go's case, it's a statically linked binary generally, which means that you can pick up that binary and copy it anywhere, and that binary will work no, without any extra libraries or installs. So if you're used to Python, I did a lot of programming in Python beforehand, and I know I used to spend a lot of time thrashing around with virtual lambs and stuff to make sure I had all the right requirements. The good thing about Go is that once you've compiled the thing and built it, you can run that Go binary anywhere, and it doesn't matter. You don't need all the build tools on there to be able to run. Um, but the, the advantages of the language are it's a, um, it's a built, it's a Google, it's a language from Google, but it's built for, um, uh, to be a sort of C-like syntax. So you've got a lot of the control over pointers and stuff like that that you don't in more interpreted languages. Uh, but you've also got, um, it's got type safety and it's got a lot of support for concurrency. So it's kind of the de facto, as much as I might get some flack for saying this, it's kind of the de facto, uh, cloud native language. So if you're doing anything <laughs> Kubernetes or you know cloud native, most of the tools that are cloud native at the moment and are part of CNCF are written in Go. Yeah. Um, Kubernetes is all written in Go. So if you're doing anything Kube related, probably you you should be learning some Go. Yeah. Uh, at least if, even if you're not going to write in it primarily, knowing a bit about it will help you understand what's going on. Well, that was going to be my next question. So speaking of learning, if people want to learn Go or to brush up on their Go skills, where would you recommend they go to? Um, so there's a couple the the basic there's a couple of great online Go tutorials. Um, there's basically a whole book of learning Go online that's available for free online. Uh, that is um, absolutely amazing. Um, Go also has the Go Playground, which is like a website where you can enter Go code and run it in your browser. Um, and it yeah. is yeah yes yeah it's really great. Um, so you can just hit run on that. And that will run that will run that code for you and you'll get the result kind of bottom of the page. Hello, playground. Um, it's, yeah. behind, it's behind me for anyone who can't see that. But it says, yeah. hello, playground, program accident. Yeah. Um, exactly. And so so you can do anything that you can do in a normal Go program program you can do there. It's often it's actually really useful a lot of the time for if you need to talk to someone about a code sample, you can put it in the playground mm -hmm. and then people can edit it as they wish and change it around and stuff like that. So a lot of Go tutorials will use the playground. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, and uh, then, I mean, for me, for me, one of the advantages of coming to work on Contour when I first started was that, uh, you know, Dave Cheney is uh, one of the big proponents of Go. He's one of those people who's written a lot of tutorials. Mm -hmm. So, you know, instead of, there was quite a few times when I'd be like, hey, Dave, how should I do this? And he'd be like, you should do this. And I'm like, didn't you write a blog post where you told me I should do something else? And he'd be like, damn. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I mean, are people kind of miss that point when they're looking at um, open source and that's that like when you're contributing open source, you're, you get to learn from all these other amazing developers around you. So um, if you've just started Go, like going to a place like Project Contour, obviously there's Go developers there because it's all written on Go. So it's such a great way to learn from those around you. 
Um, yeah, I absolutely. promise you, your skills in Google are a lot better from. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, yeah. I mean, I I would have said before I started on Project Contour, I was go literate, but yep. not fluent. And yep. now I'm. I I would feel I'm much closer to fluent. I can have arguments with people about the right the right ways to do things. <laughs> arguments with people. Yeah. <laughs> well, now, sorry, is, that, is that the standard is it that the bar so if i can well, have I think, an argument with someone about this then well I'm if you can have if you can have a strong uh opinionated discussion with somebody about some tiny little feature of the language and the best way to use it <laughs> then that says to me that you're really familiar with the language oh my gosh i wonder if anyone <laughs> in the chat has had any experience like that if you have let us know we'd like to share you know it's hilarious when you get to that stage um i know um they say similar if you start dreaming in the language that you're learning so whether it's a spoken language or a programming written language start dreaming about it then you know you're going nuts or that you're really fluent totally. in it <laughs> totally totally yeah 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 so, so yeah keep going yeah. i was about to say yeah it's like when i was writing a lot of python like you know you'd have i'd have a lot of uh vigorous discussions with people about the, you know, the right time and place to use various types of comprehension, whether they be list comprehension or dictionary comprehensions or whatever. Um, yeah, that's when you know you're, you know, you're doing the, you're doing the language for reals when you start having, you know, but we really should do this because it's the better way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's like, that's one thing I like about programming though, is that there's multiple ways of doing the one thing um, yeah, yeah. and you need to choose the thing that works best for your scenario. Um, I think that's what I really like about it. like if you give um, you know ten developers the same problem uh, or the same like you know build this function that does this this and this like some of them will be similar but there'll be, some people will use like you know a loop and other people will use like you know other things and like I'm just like I've just started doing some more programming again and um, I do it often live and some people are going no you should totally use like a switch here instead of an if statement and I'm just like. And then, and then people start arguing in my chat and I'm just like, <laughs> I just I mean, kind of sit there going, this is cool. I'm just going to let you all argue. I just like, yeah, we'll just see what happens. Yeah, totally. Is, as I said, vigorous discussion. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, you should see what happens when there's, you know, a screen in front of people and just like throwing all things in. Um, but yeah, the next thing I kind of wanted to talk to you a little bit about is um, more about like what you end up doing on, on GitHub and other projects that you might contribute to. So are there other projects apart from Contour that you um, you might like drop in on, contribute to, or um, yeah, maybe so even some that are dependent, um, have interdependencies on Project Contour? Um, so, well, most of Contour is kind of pretty high up the stack. So mm -hmm. most of we depend on things more than people depend on us at the moment. Yep. Uh, but you know we depend on Kubernetes um, and we depend on we use Prometheus metrics so we depend on the Prometheus libraries um, and also we use Envoy um, mm -hmm. and so all three of those things are, are open source now on GitHub uh, so I mean obviously Kubernetes is like you know people talk about the 800 pound gorillas Kubernetes is like an army of 800 pound gorillas yeah. <laughs> in terms of the amount of code and the sheer volume of people yep. working on it. Um, so it's probably if you've never done open source con contribution before, you know, I mean, although there's a whole group dedicated to making your life easier uh, as a new contributor, but even so, it can be very intimidating, um, you know, because there's a lot of people and mm. you know, a lot of people have been doing it for a long time and there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, but yeah, um, and so one of the things that Kubernetes does about that is that Kubernetes breaks down the project into special interest interest groups or SIGs. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm involved in a couple of SIGs um, and a working group. Um, so I'm involved in the SIG network sub-project called uh, the Service APIs, which is um, it's actually an alpha of what we do in Contour. And um, the ingress ingress is how you get traffic into a Kubernetes cluster. The mm -hmm. Service APIs is, a, is an attempt to build a new version of that, that that takes a lot of what you know people like us on Contour have learned by trying to build things that do that and build like a new version of it. Um, and so it's a pretty ongoing project. There's a lot of big, uh, you know, big companies really backing it, which is really cool. You know, it's go Google, Red Hat, um, you know, VMware, which is where I work. Um, you know, a bunch of other companies are like really very heavily invested in there. So it's a really interesting one to watch. Yeah. Um, yeah. In terms of, uh, and then in terms of small stuff, um, you know, I guess I've sort of tried to, I've helped on a bunch of other stuff. Um, I contributed a little tiny bit to uh, etcd and a couple of other things which are also ones that 
uh, Kubernetes use. Um, I'll be honest though, most of my most of my contributions have been for work rather than for fun. Um, yeah, oh, as so a, nothing wrong with that. that uh, yeah, sorry, yeah. I was going to ask about that, like because the you know Project Contour obviously relies on some of these other big projects. Do you ever encourage um, like your contributors to say, well, oh, like, hey, we are actually dependent on this project. If there's ever anything you want to do, go and contribute to make sure it's. I mean, obviously Kubernetes is not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, yeah, yeah. But do you ever do that? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll a lot of the time we'll say. Hey, is this better for us to build, or is it better for some for us to, you know, go and build it in the upstream, no, in the upstream exactly. project yeah. instead? Yeah, yeah. How um, do you decide that? <laughs> kind of a case. It's kind of a case by case thing. Um, so we're actually working on at the moment. Um, the Envoy project have a Go control plane because mm -hmm. Envoy itself is written in C plus plus rather than in Go, uh, and um, so interacting with Envoy users, um, they have their own set of APIs. And they have a special, um, they have a control plane library called Go Control Plane that mm -hmm. um, lets you write Go programs that interact with their APIs in a more easy way. Um, we, Contour actually predates that. So we've got our own code that does the same thing. And so we've been sort of looking at trying to move our code to use the Go Control Plane. And some of the stuff that we do is a little bit different to the way that the Go Control Plane does it. Some of the stuff they do is a bit different to us. And so we've been sort of talking about which bits we would build ourselves and if we move to it, like what functionality we can add back to the Go Control Plane so that everyone gets it. Mm -hmm. um, because you know, a lot of the time it's, and there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's two reasons there. One is being a good citizen, right? Like contributing upstream when you take stuff from everybody else is just being nice. But, but also there's actually a selfish motive as well, which is that when you contribute upstream, that means that other people are gonna take their code and they can fix it for you yeah. if it doesn't do what they want it as well. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so it's not just you working on it then, it's everybody working on it. Yeah, exactly. And that's one of the biggest, like, you know, reasons for open source. I, it was really interesting, actually. I was um, I was working on Blender the other day, so I was doing some stuff in Blender on my own Twitch channel, and someone came and was like, oh, Blender's so good. I'm like, yeah, I know, Blender's open source. That's what I love about it so much. They're like, oh, I hate open source. And I was like, what do you mean you hate open source? Because I told, like, they found out yeah. I worked at GitHub, and they didn't, they didn't hate GitHub. I didn't hate Blender. They hated the concept of open source. And I was like, well, why do you hate the concept of open source? They're like, oh, they just felt like it was companies being lazy and therefore open sourcing their stuff so other people can fix it. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so completely the opposite of what open source is. You know, it's all yeah. the things that you're talking about, right? Which is, you know, people working on projects together, building stuff that is, you know, better for other people, you know, making this, um, available because if you build something upstream not only can as you mentioned can they fix it but it means that they can change it and um, modify it for their needs as well so more people get to use it for more cool stuff <laughs> so yeah, can Cam in the chat's doing the whole face farm it's just like <laughs> I know right like it's oh. uh, I just it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that seems very weird. Like <laughs> it, was, it was really weird. I'm like, they must have had some bad experience with open source, or just had a very misunderstanding of what it actually is. Um, yeah, yeah it, was, I mean, it was very weird. <laughs> absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there are absolutely times where big companies do do that. They'll they'll be like, hey, this thing is open source, but by the way, you you we won't accept your PRs even if you raise them or you know something like that. Like that happens, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, it does happen. Uh, you know, but the thing about open source is that people learn that pretty quickly, and you know, and everyone will hear about the comp the, the project that's doing that. And yeah, exactly. Cool. I mean, we've got like what over fifty million developers on the platform, over a hundred and something million projects. You know, not every single one of them is gonna have be amazing, right? Like, yeah, yeah. again, it's just projects are run by people, and people sometimes have different ideas. So they must just have had someone with a you know, an interesting idea that came in and was just like, yeah, well, we're just going to open source so everyone can fix it. And yeah, no one actually from the company anymore maintains it. That's why I think, um, you know, projects like, you know, yours or Blender or any of those kind of ones that have got like, you know, people dedicated to the project as well as other people contributing just ensures that they're sustainable. Um, mm, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think, and I think the rise of the foundations like the CNCF and stuff has really helped with that. Oh, definitely. Um, because when... It, it, as a, if you're a company that's using the open source, it gives you that much more confidence that it's, it's not just some other company that is making it open source out of the goodness of their heart. Like it's actually been donated out to a foundation that's job it is to make sure that the thing is open source and is done in the right way. Yep. 
Exactly. So speaking of that, what what are your thoughts around um, GitHub sponsors? Uh, by which you mean? <laughs> GitHub sponsors, where um, people can basically donate money to projects. Oh, that's a hundred. That's a great idea. Yeah, that's, a, that's an amazing idea. Yeah, for sure. Sorry. I, <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Yeah, and I think one of my favorite things about it is like. You know, we talk about this a lot, right? The ethics of open source, and what obviously one of the ethical things about open source is, you know, if you use a project, you know, tr try and contribute back to it. Um, mm. But as you know, not everyone can. You know, they might not have the skills to do it, or all the time they don't have the time either. So I think opening up to um, for money as well is such a yeah, great absolutely. way to be like, oh look, you don't have time or skills, you can just give us money instead. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, I mean, money can be changed into time or skills. Reasonably exactly. in a reasonably straightforward fashion. So, mm. yeah, yeah. Have you considered um, if Project Conto will be on the GitHub sponsors list, or so people can, uh, can pay? Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. But uh, I mean, I think the fact that we're kind of heavily sponsored by by a big company is VMware, mm -hmm. and, and yep. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what we have. I'd have to check with the CTF if, if we're allowed. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I, I keep forgetting that you're uh, like backed by a bigger um, yeah. project as well. Uh, which I, again is another great way to do open source, and I love the fact that big companies do that. Um, now, if we look at, for example, Microsoft, biggest contributor open source in the world, um, yeah. you know, so all of their stuff, Facebook, Google, I, I just think it's great that these, you know, companies can do that. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, we've actually only recently been donated to the CNCF. Uh, that was uh -huh. only in sort of the last month or so that that actually all finally went through and we got officially donated. So um, oh, cool! Congrats. That's yeah. probably why I missed it because it's only been a couple of months. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's really exciting because yeah, now that now that means that you know, I mean, although I work for VMware, like the project that I work on, like you know, it means that all of the IP and all of the official stuff has been handed over to the CNCF, and and now even if the worst should happen, which it never will, as far as I'm concerned, but like if VMware should change their mind and say and pull me off the project, then the project, the source code st stays, stays with, with them. them. Exactly. You know, like, yeah, and I, I, did, I should say, yeah, like, there's no way that's going to happen. Right? Yeah, like, exactly. Uh, but, you but, know, you, it's always good to have the, you know, the ducks in a row, just in case. Yeah, for um, sure, for sure. And I, as I was saying to a couple people, I do a lot of startup mentoring as well. Um, having those types of things in place doesn't necessarily mean like, hey, this is here in case the thing goes wrong, which it hopefully never will. It just shows that people actually have more trust. Um, it's a it's a very weird double edged sword by having those things in place. It shows more trust, but also it shows that um, everyone knows what you're doing. Um, there's super transparent, and nothing can go wrong, um, even if you know the, the very very tiny minuscule chance that it could. It just I just feel like it just shows that. You know, that high level of trust and knowledge. Um, there. Yeah, it, shows that, it shows that you've thought about the fact that things could go wrong. Yeah, it's exactly. Like, and they value that more. Yeah, it's the open source version of buying insurance, right? Like, yeah, you know, exactly. <laughs> I like that. I'm going to use that one. Uh, doing <laughs> this is the open source version of buying insurance. <laughs> I, I've, I've picked up a few good quotes about open source Fridays. So every time someone says cool, I'm like, cool, someone clip it. That's, that's Nick's quote for the, you know, the day. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I suppose there are a couple more things before we have got about 10 minutes left. So if anyone has more questions, please put them in the chat. I know it's a little bit lighter on today, um, not being on the American time zone. Well, we often have a little less, but um, thank you everyone for being here so far. Um, but one thing I did want to chat about is um, we'll get our profile. I know you haven't done yours up yet. Are you, are you I considering? I 100% will do the GitHub profile, yes. Ooh. I'm looking forward to writing my readme, yeah. Oh, also, uh, that's cool. Um, the other one I wanted to ask you about is we often ask people, um, what are the latest, the top, well, the top, maybe not the top three, but the last three projects you starred um, on GitHub? Oh, that's a good question. You can actually go and check if you need to. <laughs> probably do need to. It's been a little while. So uh, I, think yeah, I, mean, I can even check. Yeah, you can check. I'm, actually, young, yeah, I'm yeah, young Nick yeah. on GitHub and I'm yeah. young Nick I was everywhere. like, can I check your stars? Yeah. There we go. There's your stars. So, Fedora? Did yeah. I ever say that? Yeah, yeah. So that, that was, uh, yeah. So Fedora, Fedora make, uh, Red Hat, we make Linux. We make a cool. flavor of Linux. And then, um, yeah, they um, they are building, a, they bought Coros a while ago. So this is their tracker for that. Nice. Um, but yeah, so, yeah, you can see that uh, the second one is uh, I actually use uh, Home Assistant, which is an open source home automation tool. Oh, smart app. Yep. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so that was, there's a config library where people can PR configs. Nice. This is what we do. We check like what your last stars were and why. So obviously, yeah, the VMware one, that kind of makes sense. Movie yeah. store guy. What's this one? War games. Oh, I don't even, I don't <laughs> even know why. <laughs> I was like, are you a gamer? Yes, I am a gamer. Oh, Absolutely. you are? Oh, okay. What, what do you play? Uh, so uh, Destiny 2 is my poison. Um, yep. Nice. But uh, yeah, I, I play a lot of things, but yeah, Destiny 2 is the one that sucks up most of my time. Because nice. I've got a young family, I uh, there's only so much that uh, gaming time I get. Oh, just play <laughs> Although, with kids. How, how old are they now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so they're eight and five. I actually did uh, spend Arrow a little cut, time. All the way. I actually did spend a little time the other day. Um, they were telling me what to do when I was playing uh, Ghost of Tsushima. Oh, they were telling you. Yeah, they were like, oh, Dad, go over there, check that out. Oh, okay, man. Yeah, I have not played Ghost of Tsushima yet. It's um, it's on my it's on my to playlist. It is a gorgeous game. Yeah, absolutely gorgeous. Like, uh, there's been quite a few times where I saw it. Yeah, I've, I, you know, I've been playing games for a long time, and uh, yeah, but it's one of the few games where I sort of stop and be like. Yeah, I I I think that's the thing. Like, I want to get it for the graphics. Like, it looks beautiful, and I think it was the top, the fastest selling like non big studio game for like or independent game in like ages like it's so it sold some ridiculous number of copies mm-hmm. in the first like week or so and yeah. I'm just reading um PW's comment says he always um pronounces core OS like Oreos <laughs> 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 fun fact Oreo is actually vegan for anyone who um didn't know that Oreos weren't vegan so um, I did not know that that is very yeah. interesting they use um, coconut oil instead of like milk powder or milk sauce and stuff. I'm also oh. gluten free, so I can't even have them because they're still, um, they're still they're vegan, right? but they're filled with gluten. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. Yeah, so yeah, Pink Hammer hasn't got um, Ghost of Tsushima yet, but I'm um, probably on his playlist too. But um, any yeah. other games on your on your list? Anything else you've been doing? Oh, I've been I've been working my way through um, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Um, oh, nice. Is- yeah, that was a fun game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I have been very much enjoying playing as um, uh, Alexandra and, uh, you know, having this badass lady, like, punch her way through hundreds of dudes. It's great. <laughs> <clears throat> I like it. Yeah, I did. Um, I've done nearly all the Assassin's Creed. Um, yeah, and I, the last was um, Odyssey, the Egyptian one was the last one I did. That, that um, was Origins, yeah. Origins, yeah. sorry. Yeah, sorry. sorry Odyssey, sorry. Odyssey is the ancient oh, Greek. That's right. Odyssey is the ancient Greek one. I did that as well. Um, and PKM's asking, have I played um, Black Flag and have you played Black Flag? Oh, Black Flag, that, was, that is a great game. I learned so many pirate shanties from playing that game. Oh, all the shanties, you got to collect all the shanties. I played Black <laughs> Flag as well and it was really interesting. I played it with a friend and I just did not like the, um, the, the, like, the ship stuff. Um, okay, fair enough. Which I just didn't like sailing around. I mean, I like the sailing around, the whole ship battles and things. I just didn't like it. I like the, like, the ground combat. Um, and it was really interesting because my mate who I was playing with, he liked the opposite. He liked the ship stuff, not the ground. So we were just so playing, just like, all right, it's your turn. Just keyboard and mouse over there. And you, know, <laughs> you, you go do the ship then. Oh, it's back to land. All right, your turn, Mish. That was great. Yeah. 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 The, the yeah. shanties, they were great. <laughs> it, is, it is, I agree with Pinkham, that it is an excellent pirate game. Uh, yes. You know, really, really fun pirate game. Uh, well, have you played Sea of Thieves then? I, I played a little bit when it first came out, but... Um, yeah, I've only got room for one sort of grindy online service game, and that was Destiny. So, Sea of Thieves lost out to Destiny for me, sadly. Oh, dang. Although it's a great game. It is a great game, absolutely. But, uh, yeah, it just, uh, yeah, like I said, there's only there was only room for one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know, that's the problem. Like, um, I've, I've seen that meme somewhere, like, floating around, like, when you buy a new game, but then, like, you turn around, there's, like, a pile of games that you still haven't played. Like, yeah, that, that's totally right. Like, someone asked me how um, Final Fantasy VII, the remake, was going. I was like, it's still in the packaging. <laughs> I I literally, I haven't, I didn't have a PS4 until, like, last week where a friend of mine has gone away on a, like, cool trip around Australia where they're living in a caravan for, like, six months. And so he was like, you know, hey, do you want to have my PS4? And I was like, uh, yeah. yes. Yes. <laughs> And so he brought it over and plugged it in, and I'm like, okay, just give me a minute. I'm like, sign into the PlayStation Store. I did have a PlayStation capture when I had a PS3. Sign into the PlayStation Store, and I'm like, I'm going to buy that game and that game and that, that game, game and that, that one and that one and that one. And, that one, and, that one. <laughs> he's like, and then you're like, like, bank accounts going. Do, 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 do. He's like, I've had this PS, I've had this PS4 for like nine months, and I bought one game. 
he bought the Uncharted uh, triple remake thing, oh, yeah. which was a good choice. Uh, and uh, yeah, and he's like, you spent, you bought more games in like 10 minutes than, yeah. than I have in the entire time I've had this thing. Well, um, Final Fantasy VII has a bunch of free stuff um, at the moment. Uh, if you want to go oh, cool. get some free stuff. Um, yeah, and there's, I think there's like a PS4 sale as well at the moment. So I, don't know. I do very much want to play the Final Fantasy VII remake. Yes. I played Final Fantasy It's on VII. sale. It's like 50 bucks or something. <sighs> I played Final Fantasy VII, the, the original one on... Back in 1997? <laughs> I did, yes. I played it three times, all the way through uh, Emerald and Ruby Weapon, all three times, like 150 wow. hours each time. Um, yeah. Yeah, you should. Uh, it's it's the most beautiful looking game. I mean, <laughs> oh, different type of graphic and style to go to Shima, but yeah, beautiful. You should totally play it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, there's a bunch of free like items and stuff on sale as well. Oh, uh, cool, so. cool, cool. Mm. Should definitely go that. Um, so almost at time. What are your? We've got about five minutes. What are your some of your last words of wisdom for um, people wanting to either get into open source or people wanting to either? I've got people asking how do I start an open source project or just top tips and maintainers as well. Um, so, I mean, yeah. So in terms of starting, the the best thing to do for starting an open source project is just to start it. Yeah. Um, you can sit around thinking about how you'd like to do it all day. Just start it, publish your repo. Like it doesn't matter if it's not perfect. Mm-hmm. You know, let's be real. Like until you get like more than ten users, like your like you know, your project will vanish into GitHub until <laughs> you know, until Vani- until you have <laughs> vanish into the black hole that is GitHub. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> and then uh, you know, but until you until you actually establish a critical mass of people using your project, you can do whatever you like, really. Like you know, and um, I guess. In terms of starting to contribute to something, the best way to start to contribute to something is do the stuff we talked about today. Yeah. Go and look at the con- contributing guide. Look at the good first issues. Find something you actually want to fix. Fix it up. Like speaking as a maintainer, nothing makes me more happy than when someone shows up and says, "Please, could I fix this issue?" You will never you're ever like, hear me. Oh my gosh! No. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, as if you're gonna <laughs> say no, say no, don't touch that. Say, like, well, why would you publish the thing anyway in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly yeah like uh, as a maintainer there's nothing that makes you happier even if you know i mean practically a lot of those good first issues any one of us maintainers could do them in like half an hour an hour right like the reason we leave them there is because we want people to come and do those things and learn how to do the things so that eventually maybe someone might want to climb the ladder and become a regular contributor and then you know like contra is looking for maintainers like all of our maintainers currently work for vmware we want to make it so that we don't have any ones or not so we have I, we have a contribution ladder published, like, you know, absolutely for any open source project. I guarantee you, if you show up and you do some work and then you come back and you show up again and you do more work, you will end up being a one day. If you keep doing that, you will end up as a maintainer of that open source project, almost certainly. You know, yeah. If you just keep showing up and doing the work, you will, you will be an important part of that community because that is the number one criteria of being part of the community is showing up. I think so. I think, um, you know, Pink Ham put in the chat too, like it sounds like, I mean, it's the same you do anything. When people say, well, how do I start a company? How do I start streaming? How do I start, you know, learning to code? It's like, just start. Yeah, fix <laughs> like, and do it. Like, just do even it. Even if you change your mind later, it doesn't matter. Like, yeah. you know, you having started something once makes it easier to start the next thing. Yeah, I exactly. I agree with Pink Ham that, that, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. If you're gonna, if you want to do content creation, you want to be a YouTuber. The only way to do that is to make videos. Like, <laughs> put them on YouTube. Like, yeah, sure, they'll probably be crap to start with. Everyone does that. Like, yeah. you know, like, but then one day you'll find the thing that makes you a, an interesting voice, and people. Will, yeah, will, or people go, I can't start whether it's coding or um, content creation. Um, people go, I can't start because I'm not good enough, and I'm like, whether you're coding. Or you know, starting as you know, streaming or videos or whatever. If you wait till you're good enough, people are gonna be like, "This guy looks really good. Why hasn't he got this giant audience?" Um, I'm gonna I mean, leave because they just think they just assume that you have been around for ages and you just don't have any followers uh, because your 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 stuff looks so polished. Whereas if you come in at the start, people grow with you, they learn with you, they feel like they're part of a community with you. Uh, whether you're doing content creation, like streaming, or whether you're being a developer, people are there to help you learn and grow. Um, so again, if you come in as a, I'm a newbie um, to go, can you help me? People are going to be really happy to help you. Whereas if you come yeah. in as like a, I am I know everything about Go, I spent five years learning Go just so I could contribute to this project, people are going to be like, okay, 
Yeah. Sure, yeah. like. Hey, okay, man. Like, sure, yeah, but okay. also you might probably, you're not going to be in the frame of mind of wanting to learn and wanting yeah, to, like, get involved in the community. So as B Dog, you said, this, the answer you've given, Nick, is just so inspiring. And a lot of people are just going to be there going, yes. Yeah, all yeah, you do is hit that go button. Yeah, that's, that's I mean, that's the key. Go to button doing or anything. go. <laughs> um, that's the key to doing anything is to, you know, is to actually start. Like, it's easy to dream about doing things, but, like, top tip number one for actually doing things is that just do them. Like, you know, and accept that to start with, yeah, your stuff might not be, not might not be as good as the people who you admire. That's mm -hmm. fine. Like, the people who you admire were beginners one day too. Like, you know, and, and if you make something, I, and, you you show it to the people in mind and be like, hey, I really admire you and you inspired me to do this. I guarantee that you will make their day. Oh, totally. I, I think too. I you, guarantee it. Yeah, definitely. And I think too, if you come in as a newbie, people are, give you a lot more leeway in terms of like messing up. Um, yeah. And again, like the the person who spends five years letting go to come in, you're not going to give them any leeway. You're like, you should know this stuff, bro. You said you've been coding for like five years just to learn this. Whereas if you're like, you know, it's like, oh, hey, we, you know try and give this a go or do this and you get a bit more hand holding again whether it's programming or whether it's content creation um, whether it's you know the maintainers or contributors that you're working with or whether it's an audience that you're trying to talk to people give you a lot more leeway when you're starting out so yeah, totally. um, yeah so i think yeah definitely like you said just, just get in there and start so if anyone, and i mean yeah. as I, I think i said to you earlier when we were when we were getting ready though you know i mean uh wheaton's rule always applies right like you know I mean, and what other people called in the past the golden rule, like, you know, treat the people who you respect with the way that you would want to be treated when mm -hmm. you were and you were respected, right? Like, you know, hey, if you're new and you want to show someone something cool that you think you built, like, go to them and take it to them and be like, hey, check out this cool thing. If they don't respond, they're probably just busy. It's not that they hate you. Right? Yeah, exactly. You know, you know like, you know, like, you know, you know just remember that the, that the other person on the other side is like you and is a person and look after them as much as you would want them to look after you. And I think people forget that at the moment, like in today's day and age, like they forget that on the other end, the thing or the person they're trying to get into is just a person. They have, yeah. you know, they have feelings and emotions and they get excited about stuff and, you know, things like that. So, you know, just think about like on the other end of that, that idol or someone you're trying to get in touch with, they're a person too and you can connect on a personal level. Um, so I think that's really important. I, I love that idea of like, you know, if somebody inspired you, like, send them a message <laughs> or say, yeah, yeah. like, hey, you are the one that got me into this or you inspired me to learn Go or you inspired me to contribute to this project. Like, yeah, it totally yeah. makes people's day. Yeah, I mean, but uh, I'd say the corollary to that that goes with the second thing that I said is the thing that I always try to do when I do that sort of stuff, and I still do it, right? You know, you know like I said, you know, my name may be young, but I'm not, <laughs> um, but... <clears throat> that doesn't mean that, you know, like I, I often will, I make a big effort actually to, if someone inspires me to say, to send them a thing saying, Hey, thanks for that. That was really great. I really, it was really inspiring. But at the same time, I don't expect you to reply. I just want you to read this sometime and take yeah. it to the but I don't, I, I don't, it doesn't matter to me if you reply or not, right? Yeah. Like, and exactly. to say that to someone is important because it takes the pressure off them that they have to read the thing and be like, Oh, what am I going to say to this person? What if they get upset that I asked wrong <laughs> the wrong way? All this stuff. Take the pressure off the person who you admire. Yeah. You know? Just like, yeah, don't need to respond to me. Just know that you inspired me. And it's awesome. No, I love it. Um, you totally use that joke all the time, don't you? My name is young, but I am not. <laughs> not that often. Not, not that, that often. often. Oh, it's yeah. come up about three times now. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. But, um, <laughs> no, it's, I love yeah. It. <laughs> all right. Well, I think that is a perfect spot to end it with uh, lots of inspiration for everyone. So if anyone's thinking about... Um, learning programming, getting into content creation, um, contributing to a project, um, just get in and go. Um, Absolutely. Again, people think, oh, I don't want to contribute to the project because what if they don't like me? you got cool people like Nick, you know, that are there to help you and, you know, that are running these projects. Like, again, they're, they're people. They're cool people like Nick who plays Assassin's Creed and, you know, watches his, or, you know, has your kids playing, you know, Ghost of Tsushima with you, which is crazy. But, um, yeah, like, you know, just really cool things like that. So just know that on the other end, there is a person, you can connect with them. And, yeah, just start and go and inspire people. So, again, thank you, Nick, so much for being here today. I very much appreciate your time. 
Um, no worries, thank you. Yeah, I know. Yeah, thank you so much. It was great to hear about the project, um, what you're working on, good first issues. Um, so for all those other people who are here listening in, um, we'll have some, we'll do a, a blog post on this as well. We'll have some more content. Tune in again. Same time next week, we'll have a new maintainer talking. Um, and also we have um, the American time slot as well for Open Source Friday, which we hosted by our famously amazing B Doggy Yo, who's also in the chat. So again, thanks Nick for having us, uh, for being here with us and sharing your Friday with us. And thank you to all the viewers for being here. Thanks everyone. All right. Really fun. Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye.